In today's video, we're going to be building this media cabinet or media console. Uh, the client is the same that I've been working on, the movie theater and the bar in his basement. So this is designed to match all of that. Now it has adjustable shelves on both of the ends. It's also going to have two uh, doors on this end and two doors on the other end. Now the middle has a fixed shelf and that's going to be for the speaker and the control box of all the projector movie theater uh, options that he has. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate this into two videos because I'm going to be making this entire media cabinet in the first video. And despite what you've been thinking about this top right here, as you're looking at it, this is an inch and a half thick. This is not a solid top. I will show you how I did that also. So keep that in mind. There's going to be a lot of tips and techniques and cabinet making and woodworking in this video. So definitely stay tuned for that. The second video, I'm going to upload them both at the same time and put them into a playlist um, so that you can watch them one after the other. The second video is definitely going to be for making the doors. I'm going to show you my simple technique on how I make the doors, how I get my measurements, and how I install the self-closing uh, Euro-style concealed hinges. So uh, this also has some bun feet. I'll show you how I install those. There's edge banding. These are frameless cabinets. And I have a little trick here for the shelf because it's adjustable. And since there is no back on this media cabinet, we don't want the uh, adjustable shelf flying out of the back because if you don't have something to hook onto those pins, then that's what's going to happen. It's going to roll right off the back. All right, let's get started. As always, when I'm building cabinets, the first thing I do is rip a straight edge and get rid of the factory edge on one of the edges of the plywood. That's the main staple here to getting a nice, clean reference edge. Before I get to any cross cutting, I always rip my edges parallel to the width that I need. So I'll be using my TSO parallel guides for this. You can see me setting the flip stop. And this is like having a giant sliding table saw, but in a portable setting. And I don't have a table saw in my shop anymore, so I use the parallel guides. If you guys have been following, you know I'm using parallel guides and a track saw for almost two years now without a table saw in my shop. And I've built plenty of cabinets professionally, so it works. Okay, so now I'm here over at the crosscut station, and what I need to do is first square up one edge. These are parallel from ripping. So now to square these up, what I'll do is I'll put it up against my fence, and I'll take off just a couple of millimeters off of this edge here, so that I know, number one, that I'm not wasting any material, and number two, I'm getting square edge. Now this is gonna be my reference edge because it's up against the fence. So once I cut this off, I'll be able to flip it over and I have my stop block set up at 416 right now. I need a couple of pieces at 416. Then I'm gonna reset my stop block and then make the rest of the cuts on this piece. So after I make my square cut edge, I just flip the board over end for end, put the same reference edge up against the fence and put my stop block in place and I could just go to town making my cross cuts. Now for me, this is the most efficient way to get all my parts exactly the same dimensions. Now I'll give you a quick little pro tip. You may be tempted to uh, take your stretchers. These are the stretchers for the cabinets that I cut. These are gonna sit on the inside of the cabinet and they're gonna form the structure of the back of the box and also the top so that we have something also to screw the top down into. You may be tempted to just come over here right away and say, these are small pieces, I'm gonna cut them real quick on the miter saw because they're not wide. Narrow pieces, cross cut, yeah, you would do that. However, here's a little pro tip for you. Follow me over to the cross cut station at the MFT and I'll show you something that you're gonna overlook. All right, so I've got a couple of tips for you here over at the MFT. Number one is the cross cutting that you set up for your bottoms and if you have tops, they would be the same size. We set that up for a certain size with the stop block on the MFT already. So being that I already cut all those bottoms and I still have my stop block in place, why would I go and set up a whole new stop block where there is a margin for human error? I could be off a millimeter or two for an Imperial, a 64th of an inch, a 32nd, an eighth of an inch. All that will uh, cause you problems later on in the assembly process. So instead of giving myself, you know, the um, the chance to make that human error. I'm going to take myself out of the equation. I already have this set up. So instead of going and starting, uh, you know, new with another stop block and risking it, I'm just going to take this here and I'm going to square up one edge. So what I can do is I can lift the stop block. I can put this 
just past the stop lock. And you'll notice I have the other pieces here set up on the back. And you know what that's for? If you take your pieces and not to cross cut everything in one shot, obviously you need the stop lock here, but this is going to give me support. So what I'll do is I'm going to just back these up behind the cut line. So now what's going to happen is when I drop this down, I'm not going to be cutting these pieces, but they're going to give me that support under my rail. It's not going to cause it to bend and deflect down when I put the weight of the track saw on top of the track. Because if you don't have anything back here, that's going to want to dip down and that could cause an uneven cut here. So now we could just make the cut on all our pieces right here on the MFT. Now, if you wanted to, you can also take this fence off and you could set it up in the tall position. And then you would take this uh, tall leg here, you would flip the stop lock around so that the tall leg would be at the top of the fence and you would be able to cut stacked pieces two or three at a time and that would save you time. But this is moving fast enough for me and I only need 12 of these and I already got three done. I only got to do nine more. It's going to be real quick. And now before I go any further, I have to edge band all of the fronts of my parts that are going to be facing out towards the face of the cabinet. I'm using an edge banding machine for this and a trim router and a special guillotine to make the cuts. It's all part of a set with the system in the Festool. Now, if you're not doing production runs like me, I do thousands and thousands of feet of banding per year. I need this. But if you don't have it and you don't do the production runs, and then iron is fine for you guys. Pre-glued edge banding. Now the client wants the same groove all around the sides of the cabinet carcass as I have on the bar that we made uh, in the beginning of the year. So I'm just going to make little marks at the edge here. These are reference marks and I'm going to go around it with a V-groove bit with the router and make it exactly like I made the bar. The doors are going to match this later on. You'll see in the second video as well. Now I'm using a router with an edge guide and I'm just following the center line that's marked on my router base which makes this a lot easier because I can stop anywhere that I need to and start from wherever I need to. But if you don't have a router like mine then you can just make some kind of a jig that you can ride the router in and that'll give you your stop and go points. Now the both end cabinets are going to have an adjustable shelf so I need to make shelf pinholes. Now I have the LR32 system which is more for professional and production runs but you can accomplish the same thing with a handheld drill and a shelf pin drilling jig. There's plenty on the market. Now here's a tool that I definitely waited way too long to buy. This is the Craig Foreman. Now it's not a sponsored video at all. I purchased this with my own money but I thought it was time to upgrade because I was so tired hand drilling out all those pocket holes and making a mess. This is absolutely 10 times faster and it has great dust collection. Okay guys, so we're gonna start assembling the boxes now for the cabinet carcasses of this media console. But a couple of quick tips before we get started on that. Number one, you can see I pre-stained all the inside uh, panels and it's just easier to do this now than rather put it together and try to do it later and try to reach into those corners and everything like that. So that's number one. Uh, second thing is to assemble it, I'm going to be using uh, brad nails, 18 gauge brad nailer with one and a half inch um, brad nails. And the reason I'm going to use that is to tack it together just to hold it in place so that I can uh, put the pocket screws in and that will permanently screw it together. And if you've used pocket screws before or really any kind of screws, you'll know that sometimes with plywood especially, the uh, screw wants to follow the uh, plies and go up and down and move the piece around and shift it. So unless you're using a clamp, then you really have a chance, especially with pocket screws, of the pieces shifting out of alignment. So that's number two. Number three, we don't, regardless of what you think, you don't need glue when assembling cabinets. Now, if you want this to be uh, together permanently and you're never going to make it modular and add on to it or anything like that, you can go ahead and you can use glue and you can put it together and it will never come apart because the glue is stronger than the wood itself. So that's number three. Uh, I'm not going to be using glue. If ever I want to change this around for the, the client, if they want to add things in, they want to make it modular, I'm going to put it all together and bring it there in one piece because I have the room to do it. I have the room to maneuver and bring it in there. But if, let's say, it was a tighter space, this is a rather long piece and if it didn't fit in one shot to bring it in, then I would make it modular and just put it together on site. But I don't need to do that because I have the room to get it out, I have the room to transport it, and I have the room to bring it in. So that's going to be all one piece. Um, 
you don't need glue. You don't need dominoes. You, you, all you need is to tack it together with the brad nails and then screw it together with either regular screws or pocket screws. The only reason I'm using the pocket screws is because, like I said, I have to make this uh, the screws hidden because there's going to be uh, the end panels. I don't want to screw everything together and have to fill it. Also, you'll notice that um, since I'm using a brad nail, usually I use a narrow crown stapler, which is much stronger hold. It's much bigger hole to fill on the outer panels, so that's why I'm not going to be doing it. Now get started with the assembly process by tacking the sides into the bottom, making sure that I'm flush on the bottom by putting it together on a flat surface. And here I'm using my pork workbench, which I know is dead flat. Next I'll install one of the top stretchers. Once that's tacked in place, I can flip the cabinet over and install the back bottom stretcher or nailer board if you're going to put this as a built-in into a wall. And this is just going to keep everything square and make it easy for me to assemble the rest of the pieces. There's only two more stretchers. You guys notice the pattern yet? Well, every time I install the stretcher or when I install the bottom, I'm always referencing a flat surface. So I'm flipping the cabinet over and installing them against the bench to ensure that all my parts stay flush. Okay, so now you ended at this point here, so just leave it in this position. Obviously, first check square, which I did already from corner to corner on the diagonal. You'll see that everything's square. You can put a square in the corners. And now since you're here, instead of flipping it back over, you might as well attach these pocket screws. This way it's less shifting around at the cabinet. You're already here, might as well start here. solid cabinet box. As I assemble the cabinets, I'll stack them on my MFTs and put them together in the order that they're going to go, kind of like a dry fit. Leave that there. I'll assemble the last one, stick it right there. This way I can take an overall measurement and then not only can I get the measurement for my top, but I can see if my measurements are completely accurate of what I drew up in the plans. Okay, the last piece together and going down here. Like this on the edge, you can see that's where the design is. You can see I already stained the bun feet. Those are going on after everything is completely assembled. So that is going to sit like that. Clamp that together. Screws from the inside. So this side here is going to get two doors. This is going to get a middle fixed shelf for that speaker. And then there's going to be two doors on this side. And those doors on the front are going to have this uh, little marking there, this little detailed groove around the whole front of the door. It's just like the bar that I did for this client. Okay, so this is the middle of the media console here. We're going to have a speaker sitting on the top. The client has a speaker that has a wood housing uh, replicant. It actually matches this. I'll show you that in just a second. But I want it up here. This is where he wants the speaker, so I want to put the shelf right here. I measured down uh, 150 millimeters from the top of the shelf to the inside portion here of the stretcher. So the easiest way to do this and the most accurate way is to flip the entire cabinet carcass over. And what we're going to do to make this exact is since this is going to be sandwiched in between two other cabinet carcasses so I'm going to be screwing through this way. But I made some spacers here at 150 millimeters, the exact measurement that I need. And I'm going to be placing those right inside here, right against the inside portion there, just like that. Then I'm going to take my shelf, remembering that this is the side that I want as the top of the shelf. So what I'm going to do is a little dusty here, is make sure that since I know the cabinet's upside down and this is going to be the top that's visible of the shelf. I'm going to put it in this way upside down, just like this. And I also want to make sure that I set the reveal on this in the front. So the way I'm going to do that is with this tool right here. And this is basically a pocket rule. It has a guide on it. And it's kind of like setting draw slides a little bit, you know. I'm going to portion it back just enough. I'm going to set my stop at the 10. 
I'm just going to tap it in place. I don't want to go in here and drill in and put the screws in blind because you could miss. We're not going to take that chance. We don't leave anything to chance here. We want accuracy. So what I'm going to do is put T-square up against and put it right to the middle. Make a mark straight across. I'm going to bring it to my other side. You can measure up, put a mark, and then put your T-square up to it and then run the line. It's the same thing. Okay, so this is the speaker that's going to sit right here in the fixed shelf. It's very lightweight, and you can see it matches pretty much the finish. This is going to get a little darker when I spray the clear coat on it, and then everything's really going to match perfect. So let's just put this in here the way it's going to sit. It'll sit back a little bit, and it'll be centered between the sides, and it'll sit just like that right in there. There'll be plenty of room underneath for another unit for something else and also in the back here where uh, this is the whole purpose of having the open back is for the breathing room and also to snake the wires in there there's going to be a black wall behind it the other two sides are going to have uh, the doors on them so that's going to be closed in okay so the positioning of the screws this side is going to have the doors on it i'm going to do the same to the other side i have everything flushed up and in place with clamps and so now i'm going to be using also black screws to hide it with the black stain Now on this side here, I can hide a screw underneath the shelf and underneath the stretcher. I won't need one down here on the bottom because it's going to be open and exposed and I don't want it to be seen. Also, on the bottom of this, when I have everything attached, I'm going to flip it backwards and I'm going to be having connecting plates that are going to support both pieces on the bottom at the seam. Since this is a long piece and I have the room to bring it there in one piece, once the top goes on, this whole thing is gonna be completely one solid unit. Okay, so this is gonna be the top of the media console. The client wanted it double thick to emulate like a, an inch and a half of a piece of solid wood or if he was to put granite on there, it would have been an inch and a half. So with the solid wood here, what I did was I doubled up the plywood. I glued two pieces together and then I screwed the pieces down together to hold it in place as a clamp and then filled all the holes. This is actually the bottom part that's gonna go upside down onto the cabinet. So this is gonna be all completely hidden by all the stretchers. So even though these holes are filled and they're still invisible, you're definitely never gonna see them. So this will be the actual top of it that will be exposed. But what I'm gonna do to keep with the theme of the frameless cabinetry and keep this looking like one solid sheet of inch and a half thick wood, I have two inch red oak edge band. And what that's gonna do is get applied just like this and then we're gonna trim it off the same way. So I'm gonna be using the Contouro with this thick edge banding and we're gonna put it on just like this. Okay guys, so I got you off the tripod here for a second just so I could show you a close up of the way the top came out. This is two pieces laminated together and here is the edge banding up close and you can see it's a little dark on this side of the shop here because the light in the background is actually drowning out this whole area right here where the edge banding is. So let me see if I can bend down like this then you can see the grain pattern. And you can see that wraps all the way around. And this appears to be one solid piece of red oak, one and a half inches thick. Okay, so now I'm gonna install the bun feet, which are right here, and they go onto this plate and they just screw in. You have to install the plate. So what I've done was I marked down 25 millimeters or one inch in Imperial, and I made a mark there so that I can just bring it down to that line right there where I want it. And then what I did was I marked the center and I pre-drilled a small hole. And the reason is because when you put these bun feet in, the threaded rod that's in there has a tendency to go past the nut that's inside of the plate. And then what happens is it hits and contacts the bottom of the carcass. Well, if you pre-drill out a, a small slot for that, then you have enough room where it's not gonna contact the inside of that and you can thread it all the way in and the plate won't sit, uh, can't leave it in there. So now these just go in with regular pan head screws that come with it and they they're just slightly less than an inch maybe they're about maybe they're about seven eighths maybe they're about three quarters and with the thickness of the plate they won't go through the other side what you 
do is just thread these on. Now this is just the dry fit. And that's it. You're just going to turn it until you're square with the cabinet carcass. And that's it. You have your bunt feet installed. And now it's time to install the top and wrap this thing up. Okay guys, so I really hope that you enjoyed the first part of this uh, two-part series in the media cabinet build. That's it for this video. Make sure that you head over to the second video immediately after this one, or if you want to watch it later, that's fine too. And that second video is going to be how I make the doors for the both ends of this and how I install the hinges and how I set them and make the perfect reveal on each end of all of the doors. All right, thanks for tuning in, guys. Make sure that you head over to that second video and check out how I'm going to make the doors.